I'm excited today. You see, I probably say that a lot, but I really, I don't know why, because it's real easy, especially if you've grown up in church your whole life, like, oh, it's another Palm Sunday. Uh, we're going to wave palm branches. Kids will sing. It'll be cute. Yay. Um, but I want us to think this morning in terms of we do the same things over and over because God's truth is in there, but God always has something fresh and something new for us through his word. As we reread, as we relook at the stories of, of who Jesus is and his interactions with God's people and, and God's word interacting with us, each and every time we do that, we're not only joining with the body of Christ around this entire globe, which is kind of exciting. We're all looking at and talking about the same thing today. What a beautiful picture of the entire body of Christ, all focusing on the same aspect of Jesus across this planet. And so we, we gather not just ourselves, but with brothers and sisters around the world. And so I just want to challenge us this morning, invite us today to not assume this Palm Sunday is like any other Palm Sunday. The story is the same, but what God wants to do within us is something fresh. So let's take a moment and invite the Holy Spirit to do something new and fresh within us today. So just in your own words, just take a moment and just invite the Holy Spirit to do something fresh within us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we read the prophet's words. He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. That was a phrase that was often used to refer to God's people, his people being like this precious daughter, this child of his. So guys, you're a daughter of Zion, all right? Just deal with it. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, referring to the holy city of God's people. So as we read that, we can kind of see it saying, rejoice, God's people. Shout, God's people. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was written over 500 years before Jesus would ride into Jerusalem, fulfilling that very prophecy. And that prophecy predicts not only that a king would come to them and identifies the nature of this king as well, that this king would be righteous right before God, blameless from sin, victorious, undefeated by his enemies. He would accomplish his purposes and humble. He would enter his kingdom and take his throne, not with war horses and chariots, but humbly on a young donkey. So one of the things I want us to look at this morning as we look at the entry into Jerusalem this morning is the fact that the the king to come would be like no earthly king before or after. In their words and in their world at that time and even in ours, worldly monarchs, kings and queens sit in their palaces and, and you have to go to them. And only if invited uh, and or if allowed, I can tell you firsthand experience, um, Hillary knows where this is going. We lived overseas. We, we served in missions, and uh, I was taking a guest around, and we were exploring the, the seacoast in the city of Tunis. The, this president was no longer in power, so I can safely say this. And I decided we're going to walk around this beautiful coast, and we're going to, to see this marina and all these cool boats. You know, the ancient city of Carthage is there. How cool would that be? And go and see these boats. So I'm taking the guest, and, and we get close to a this fence on the beach coming out of the hillside that goes on concrete about 20 feet out into the water with rusty razor wire going up the hill. Now, most people would think we shouldn't go there. My mind says, oh, look at this rusty razor wire. It's been abandoned for a long time. And look how rusty the padlock is on the door going through this gate. I'm sure this is just for the marina. It's open. Let's just walk around out on the concrete, into the ocean, around the fence, back to the other side. And so I did so. And we're walking along, and all of a sudden, we hear a very excited voice from a gentleman up on the hill, dressed in solid green, holding a machine gun. 
he was not excited to see us and uh and was and so in my biggest dumbest face hi you know and i'm like oh you want us to go that okay and we turn and we st- and i said do not pick up your phone or hold any recording device right now and right as i said that i look and off the coast is a boat trolling escorting us back out of this property i'm like well that's weird so i told our friend she goes janet the president lives there so apparently, you can't just go unannounced onto a, a president or king's property. Um, just throwing that out there. So what is amazing is Jesus is the king who comes to us. He humbled himself and came to us. A king, a, a person of, of that status would never lower themselves to go to a, the, the people, or especially the least of these. Yet we see Jesus doing that very thing but the king the king and savior promised to god's people i love that the prophet says see what he's saying when he says see he's saying look there is something different see there is something different about your king there's something different about the one who is to come and he comes to you in philippians chapter 2 verse 7 through 9 We read, Apostle Paul says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, saying even a shameful, humiliating death. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, And gave him the name that is above every name. And I love just the dichotomy of it. We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God in flesh is our King. And yet he rules so differently from the world. And the way he rules, the way he came to us, is what actually brings victory, is actually what transforms, is actually what saves us. Jesus came to us. The king came to us. He came to his own people. We don't find our way out of our messes and lives to find Jesus. He comes to us where we are and invites us to follow him. And he leads us into healing and restoration. It'd be so easy for other kings and other people with say, well, you should come to me. I'm the one. You should come to me. No, Jesus says, I know you don't even know what you need. I'm coming to you. Like the blind man named Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. Jesus came to where Bartimaeus was. As he was walking by, this man was crying out, wanting to be healed and to see Jesus. And this is one of the stories leading up before the cross. And Jesus heals and opens his eyes to see him. And Bartimaeus began to follow Jesus. We also see in John chapter 11 another story of Jesus coming to us, coming to his people, a foretelling and a prophetic picture of what he was doing on a larger scale soon on the cross. In John chapter 11, we see the story of Lazarus, who was a friend of Jesus, who who died while Jesus was out of town. They sent messengers to, to tell Jesus that Lazarus was sick and ask him to come to Lazarus. I mean, talk about nace up your sleeve. Like, you're sick, and oh, we've seen Jesus heal blind people. We've seen Jesus uh, do this and that. Like, he should be able to heal him. And so they send for Jesus. You know what's interesting? Jesus took his time. We read in the story, and I encourage you to read through that, uh, especially this Holy Week. Read through John 11, the story of Lazarus. Um, But Jesus takes his time on purpose. How many of you get frustrated with Jesus because he takes his time? He takes his time. You know, we have a plan. They had a plan. Lazarus is sick. You know, if he could come to me right now, 
everything will be fine. If Jesus would just show up and do exactly what I need him to do right now, everything will be fine. And I love this. We see that Jesus does come to us, but he comes to us in his perfect timing. Lazarus dies before Jesus arrives. Everyone is mourning, and Lazarus' sister tells Jesus he's too late. Reading the story, she's like, Jesus, you're too late. How many of you have ever felt like that? You've had that conversation with God, I think you're too late. We felt that for maybe other people. Maybe we've even felt that for ourselves. God, you're too late. I've certainly said that to God. But then Jesus inevitably helps me to see that I'm impatient for what I want. But what he has for me is far better and is always on time. The people begin to mutter to Jesus behind his back, Jesus healed a blind man. He could have probably easily have healed good old Laz if he had been here sooner. But now it's too late. I love, they have this level of faith that if Jesus was there working the way they have seen him work and the way they thought he should work, everything would be okay. But they didn't have the fullest picture of who Jesus was yet. They didn't fully understand who he was. That he humbled himself as a servant. He came, but he wasn't there to fulfill their will and their purposes but that all power rested in him and that he had come to fulfill his plans and purposes. And they said, but now it's too late. But they didn't fully understand yet who had come to them. So if they fully understand who Jesus was, they would realize any time that he was there with them, it was not too late. They didn't know yet that it was the King of kings and the Lord of lords who had come to them. They didn't know yet that the same power that spoke and exploded the universe into existence was the same power that flowed with Jesus' words. They didn't know yet that the very breath of life that God breathed into Adam was the very breath that Jesus exhaled when he spoke to them. So I want us to look here briefly, John 11, chapter 17, verse 44, the rest of this story. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. That's one, just a side note, uh, one thing that that culture does so well is just supporting and loving one another. Verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha thought he was giving her just a bigger theological answer. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Uh, Martha was the smartest one in the whole bunch of the disciples. Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. 
Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. So just a little context. In that culture, that mourning is a big thing. You go and you go to the grave and you throw yourself on it and you wail and you cry and it's just this guttural, very powerful experience that happens, unlike our culture where we just get very quiet. There was just this, this freedom. And so for them, this was something they were supposed to, they're supposed to go, and, and then they're supposed to mourn and make noise with us. They're like, oh, here we go again. So they're going out, thinking she's going to, to go throw herself on the grave and begin to cry out. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. One, we see the heart of God is moved. He he came, he took upon himself all of our burdens, but also our pain and our suffering. And we see that Jesus is moved, God is moved by human suffering. That is why he came to heal and to bring restoration, but also there's this element of he's he's troubled in his spirit because they don't fully know who he is yet. They don't fully know what he is offering them. Though if they had known, there would just be, there would be a whole different conversation taking place. They have this sense of hopelessness, and yet right before them in flesh is hope. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. And first, I want us to look at that. Again, deeply moved. Our king has come to us. God has come to us because he loves us. Because he is moved by us. Because he desires us to, to live and to not be stuck in death and desperation. God, the heart of God mourns for humanity. The heart of God mourns for those that we mourn for. Those that we mourn for, God mourns for even more because he loves them. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been dead for four days. That would be ripe. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I love that. There's this picture of we think God has come to us too late. And we think, Lord, even if you begin, even if you try to fix me, even if you try to fix this person, God, it's too late. The mess. I'm so messed. Lord, if you bring me into your body, if you bring me into your church, I'm just going to make a mess and I'm going to reek and it's just going to be horrible. Yet Jesus said, do you not believe? Did I tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. It's never too late because when the king shows up, when Jesus shows up, the glory, the presence, the life-changing, life-giving, restorative work of God is there. So they took away the stone. How would you like to have been that guy? Like, I'm, I believe you, Jesus, but I'm just going to put this clothespin on her. It's just like holding your breath as you roll that stone. I trust you, but just in case. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. 
But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Again, he's revealing his nature of who he is. Revealing who has actually come to them. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. That's a whole nother sermon right there. But it was after this that more and more people began to see that Jesus was the king prophesied by Zacharias, the other prophets, and in the Psalms. So let's go to Luke chapter 19, verse 29 through 44. Jesus is beginning his journey into Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. That sounds like a great idea. Anyone ever ridden an animal that you're not supposed to ride? It's a lot of fun, but not how you want to make an entrance if you're a king. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Hey, kids, if I sent you to the one of the neighbor's house and I told you, hey, go um, ask the neighbors for the keys to their brand new car because your pastor needs it, um, how do you, well do you think that would go? Very well. You think so? Yeah. Okay, they know. Well, let's say you go to someone who doesn't know me. All right. I, I feel good. People would actually let me drive their brand new cars. So in this case, it's kind of a funny story, but there's also a little tell in this story. So in that culture, a, a lord or a king, someone of dignitary, they could acquire or acquisition uh, your property and use it and bring it back to you. And it was considered an honor to do that. Um, so this part of this is miraculous, but it's miraculous and also telling us there is a divine, there is a kingship, there is authority in who Jesus is. The Lord needs it. Verse 32, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the cult, his owners asked them, why are you untying that cult? They replied, the Lord needs it. (laughs) They replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And so in a couple of the other accounts, uh, we read that, that because of the resurrection of Lazarus, the word was spreading. People are excited, like, this is the king. And so they're all starting to gather, like, this is it. This is our king. But yet at the same time, they still were thinking a different type of king. But in this moment, they began to realize the Messiah had come. They were shouting and giving praise. They were excited. And I just want us to get a hold of that this morning. We know who came. We know who has come to us. And may we allow the Holy Spirit to stir us with Zechariah's words that we shout, that we sing, that we celebrate, that it is a part of us, that exuberance, that knowing who Christ is and what he has done for us. They began to throw their cloaks and their palm branches. They were kind of their equivalency of a, of a red carpet, laying it out before him lest mud and things splatter on their king. They were giving him honor. And in that culture, too, a lot of times your coat, if you were a certain trade or wealthy, you had a nice coat, and that set you apart. And so they're taking off their status, and they're throwing it before Christ, saying, we are nothing compared to you. They're laying everything, who they are, their best before him, and honoring who Christ is. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully 
to praise God in loud voices for the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They began to quote Psalm 118. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Because this isn't just the king of one nation. This is the king of all creation. The words of the prophet Zechariah echoing, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you. These religious leaders who wanted Jesus to tell his disciples to stop doing what had been prophesied would happen. These leaders had their eyes closed so tight with pride and arrogance and a lust for power that they didn't see their king who had come to them. They didn't recognize their own king because they were looking for a king and a savior who looked like the world's kings and champions. Because of this, reading on in verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. So immediately these Pharisees are saying that they're saying, you're not the king worthy of praise. You're not the king we want. You're not the king we envisioned. Your type of power is not the power we are willing to recognize. And so these leaders, who are also the leaders of the city, we read, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, He's saying, even these Pharisees, even those with the hardest of hearts, if even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. If they had only known the heart of God, if they had only known what would truly bring them peace and restoration, they would have seen and recognized the king who had come to them. The religious leaders of the city rejected Jesus. They, they didn't realize that what would save them was a king like Jesus. They were looking for this roaring lion uh, like the world's kings. But as we see in Revelation, they looked for the lion of Judah who was. He was the victor. But when they looked, he became a lamb. Their lion was a lamb. And so they would put their trust in themselves and scheme and manipulate and wait for a king like them. A king not humble, not righteous. And many false saviors who would eventually fail would come and go. But this moment, Jesus then predicts what would happen over half a century later with the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in 70 AD. Verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus has come to each and every one of us in this room. And may we ask God to fully open our eyes to see and understand who he is. And may we rejoice and celebrate that he has come. By his spirit, he came in flesh And that he has come by his Holy Spirit and that he will return in full again. And because of that, we can respond to the words of Zechariah and rejoice greatly. We can shout 
Because we see that our king, our hope, our salvation, everything we need has come.